What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the channel. Today we're gonna to talk about The Chosen, which is apparently the greatest Christian television show that's ever been on since, what, has there ever been any good Christian television shows on before? Anyways, so many people have been asking me about my opinion on this that I thought I would finally weigh in. Uh, a day late and a dollar short, I know a lot of people have already given their opinions on The Chosen, but you have asked me, you have emailed me, some people have asked me in person, uh, what do I think about this television show? I think you should know what I think about the television show. Don't you? Don't If you subscribe to this channel, if you've seen my videos before, you should already know what my view is, but I'll give it to you anyways on this particular video. Hey, uh, check this out. I got this new punching bag here in the background. Pastor David gave that to me as a Christmas gift. It says right here on the back, take out your frustration on this desktop punching bag instead of your coworker. So there you go. Apparently David is concerned with workplace violence, but I can assure you that there is none. It's a funny little joke. I'm not sure if I'm gonna leave it in the background of my channel though, because I have to have the aesthetic here just so perfectly coiffed and, and uh, presentable to you. I really work hard on the background of, of my channel here. Anyways, so we're going to talk about the show, The Chosen, today. Now, I will tell you this. I thought The Passion of the Christ was one of the most um, stirring movies, Christian movies, that I've ever seen. In fact, I remember um, just being almost overwhelmed by the, the captivating, um, moving power of seeing Christ be crucified as Mel Gibson has him tortured, essentially in the movie *The Passion of the Christ*. Of course, it goes way beyond, in some uh, in some senses, what a normal human being should be able to take. If Mel Gibson literally portrays what a crucifixion crucifixion looks like, uh, I don't know. There's just some weird things in that. I remember when? He pounds a nail through his hand into the crossbeam, and then blood somehow makes it all the way through the, the wood as well. I don't, there's just a lot of artistic license there. Anyway, when that movie came out, I was really stirred by it, but I had not yet come to the conviction that I hold today. Um, that was a number of years ago when I have when I watched and appreciated that movie. I have since changed my mind on having images of Christ altogether, but that's just to give away the plot, isn't it? Um, anyway, thanks for checking into the channel. My name is Matthew. I'm the pastor here at Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a reformed Bible-believing church just north of Pittsburgh here in western Pennsylvania. I'd love for you to come check us out in real life. By the way, hey, check this out. I got some news for you today before I talk about The Chosen. Um, so my YouTube channel, which is where you probably get my content, most of my opinions and theological matters and all the studies and sermons and Bible teaching that I do on this channel, I wanted to let you know today that uh, starting now, all of my content is also going to be on Spotify. So that's pretty cool, right? So I've been looking into taking the audio version of these YouTube chats and turning them into podcast episodes. So uh, it's officially up on Spotify right now. You can go subscribe to that. Also on Google Podcast as well. I did a little survey about what people listen to as far as their podcasting apps go. And Spotify, I think, came in second place right behind Apple's podcasting app, which I'm not going to use because I don't use Apple or Mac or anything. So I don't even really want to get into that world. So if you want to listen to these episodes just while you're driving or doing whatever you, you want to do, um, you can now follow on Spotify or on Google Podcast as of this episode. I've already uploaded about 12 or 14 of my better, most of my longer form content, to be completely honest, not the short little tiny pieces. I think I'm going to mostly stick with the longer form pieces here. But nevertheless, um, I am not going to watch the show The Chosen. And no matter how much you beg me, no matter how much you plead with me that it's great, I'm not going to watch it. I'm not interested. This is my take. This is my opinion here. You can have your own opinion, and I'm not going to judge you for it. Um, I may think you're wrong. You may think I'm wrong. Maybe you think I'm missing the boat. Maybe you think that The Chosen is uh, the best Christian TV show since I don't know any other Christian TV shows. Uh, maybe you think it's an outstanding opportunity for evangelism. I'm going to have to disagree with you on this matter. But uh, let me, nevertheless, let me give you seven reasons why I'm not going to watch it. Okay, first of all, and this is what I alluded to, you should know already, if you're a subscriber of this channel, that I have a strong but minority, apparently, position on images of Christ. And that goes back to the fact that I am a Presbyterian. I am a Westminster Confession subscribing Presbyterian. And that means that I hold to some very traditional and indeed conservative views when it comes to 
images of Jesus Christ, any kinds of images, whether it's stained glass windows or whether it's Jesus on greeting cards for Christmas or whether it's uh, Jesus's on the cross necklace that you wear. We as Reformed Presbyterians are against images of Christ. Now you can debate us on that. I'm open to some debate. Give me some healthy pushback. And so, in fact, there are quite a few Presbyterians that take an exception to this part of our confession and our catechisms, but nevertheless, it is part of our confession and our catechism. See, part of the problem here, I think, in the Reformed tradition is that not everybody's really read what it is that we claim to believe in our confessional statements. That's why they're there, so you can know exactly what it is that we really and truly do believe. And so if you get through the confession, you get to the what we might call the appendices. They're not really appendices. They're their own documents. But we have two catechisms. We have the Westminster Shorter Catechism and we have the Westminster Longer Catechism. And if you read to Longer Catechism 109, it has a very traditional and yet standard Protestant Reformed view of images of Christ. And the truth of the matter is that whether you subscribe to the Westminster Confession of Faith or the Heidelberg Catechism or the Belgic Catechism, or if you want to go back and look at the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, um, these documents say, in essence, that Christians ought not to use images of any of the three persons of the Trinity. And so, yes, that includes the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you want to know more about that, I have an entire video on my Reformed View series on my YouTube channel where I get into a lot of the background of that. But that's my first reason I'm not going to watch The Chosen because it depicts Jesus and I'm Presbyterian. So so we don't do that. Now, again, you can disagree with me, but you'd have to substantiate your disagreement and perhaps depart from our confessional documents. If you do that, of course, then uh, you are moving away from the Reformed tradition. And it is unambiguous and undisputed that the entirety of the Reformed movement of the, of Pro the Protestant first couple of centuries there agreed that images of Christ are not helpful. And in fact, they do purvey um, what is essentially false teaching about who Jesus is and what his natures are. He is the God-man. He is the one who is both divine and fully man. Okay, so so I'm not going to watch The Chosen because it depicts Jesus. Now, again, we could talk about that all day, but let me give you a second reason why I'm not going to watch The Chosen, and that is because it has invented dialogue for Jesus. Now, you'll say to me, and I can almost hear you doing so, well, if you're going to do a movie of Jesus or a TV show of Jesus, you would have to, wouldn't you, invent some dialogue to fill in the spaces. You couldn't just quote the scriptures. I mean, you could quote the scriptures, but if you're going to make a movie or a television show, much less a series, then you'd have to invent some dialogue that would kind of fill the gaps between this scene and that scene. In other words, if Jesus is at the seashore and he sees John and James, the sons of Zebedee, and he calls out to them, and there might be a little bit more of a conversation that happens between these particular persons, biblical characters. But but here's the problem. Uh, I'm not so much against inventing dialogue for any old uh, biblical character, but when you invent dialogue for Jesus, you you run a real risk. And, and the risk is simply this. Jesus's speech throughout the four Gospels is entirely unpredictable. In fact, I might even go as far as to say wildly unpredictable, which is part of what makes Jesus such a dynamic teacher as he is. Because in every conversation, almost every conversation that Jesus finds himself in in the Gospels, he will say something that stuns not only the reader who's reading the Gospel, but the original hearer with whom he is in conversation. Jesus is almost entirely surprising, and that's part of what makes Jesus the powerful teacher that he is in the Gospels. You remember, of course, that in the Gospels a couple of times it says that he is not like the scribes, for he is one who teaches with authority. And part of that authority is the way Jesus often shocks the hearer with what he says. And so you can look at the conversation, for instance, with Nicodemus, where Nicodemus can hardly believe what he is hearing, and he's trying to keep up with Jesus, but obviously he, he is falling behind and he's he's unable to understand everything and even to predict what Jesus is going to say next. Same thing too with Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman in the Gospel of John. We might think of uh, his conversation with the rich young ruler who at every point in that conversation, he shocks, he stuns, he keeps turning abruptly 
and the rich young ruler is, is left kind of beside himself with stunned surprise at what Jesus says next. So too with his arguments with the Pharisees. The Pharisees would come to Jesus with these well-concocted arguments. They would lay them before Jesus, expecting to trap Jesus in what he is saying, and boom, Jesus would make a move and he's darted off like the Lion of Judah that he is. Same thing with his conversations with Peter. Here's my point. Anytime you have a Hollywood writer or a producer who's going to, quote, fill in the gaps just a little bit for Jesus, what they're trying to do is to invent the kind of dialogue or the kind of speech that Jesus is likely to say in such circumstances. But if you've read the Gospels at all and you're honest with the intellectual power and the, 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 the highly combustible teaching potency of the Lord Jesus Christ, then one of the things that you have to reckon with is nobody can invent such dialogue. It's impossible. Even little filler dialogue, you're, you're going to say, eh, I think Jesus would probably say this, or he would, he would say something that's uplifting to this person here. Um, what about the Phoenician woman? Did he say anything in that conversation with her? that you could have possibly predicted? I don't think so. How about at the cross, even when Jesus is dying on the cross? Of course, you know the sayings of Jesus from the cross because you've read your Bible, but would you have predicted any of those things? No, and, and so anytime somebody says, you know, I, I know what Jesus would likely say in such and such a situation, I have to say to you, I'm sorry, but I don't believe it. I don't think that you would know or be able to invent speech for the Lord Jesus, okay? You could do it for Moses, you could do it for Saul, you could do it for Bathsheba, that's fine with me, but when you start talking about inventing dialogue for Christ, I think you're going to run into serious problems. Now, third, I really struggle with Hollywood commercialism here um, because The Chosen is, after all, a product that is attempting to be marketed to a broader audience. Now, before I critique too harshly here, I should simply say this. We need more family-friendly programming. There's no question about that. Whether it's Netflix or whether it's YouTube TV or, or whether it's, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, Amazon Prime, there is a huge market, I think, for conservative programming. And the second that Amazon Prime or Netflix could wise up to this, I do think that there's a killing to be made. There's a lot of money to be made with just dialing back some of the grossness, some of the sexuality, some of the um, some of the implications, some of the unseen gore, the violence, uh, the superfluity of naughtiness, as the King James version says. Uh, there's a there's a great huge audience waiting to consume traditional, faithful, just relatively conservative. Uh, product. Can we get a show that doesn't feature a, a transgendered furry or something like that? I mean, that would be nice, right? It'd be, it'd be great to see any TV show that doesn't have some sort of illicit lovemaking scene between two of the characters and parents have to hold their hands over their kids' eyes. I think there's a huge market for that. However, let me just simply say this. Anytime money gets involved, the potential for this thing to go awry is very strong, <laughs> okay? Because uh, because here's why. It's, it's not that Christianity can't have some products, okay? Obviously, we have Christian publishers. We have, uh, I don't know, Christian highlighter pens, things like that. Um, Christian t-shirts, whatever. Let's set all that aside. But but here's the problem. When it comes to Hollywood-style productions, you really have three people, three sets of people that you have to keep content with the content of the production, whether it's the movie, the TV show, whether it's a Netflix series, whatever. you got three groups. You've got the viewers who have to be happy. But secondly, don't forget, it's not just the viewers. It's the sponsors. Which corporations want to put their name on that particular product? And then third, you have the platform itself. Who wants to carry that product. Okay, so the broader you spin out this thread, the more wide groups you have to keep happy with the product. It's hard enough to market a product to a wide mass of viewers. And to do that, you kind of have to dial back some of the things that are offensive about Jesus. Um, some of the things that are obviously offensive about the Bible, what the Bible actually teaches on, let's say, gender or morality or ethics or even salvation. Okay. It is offensive to be told one is a sinner and needs to repent. 
So who's the market for that? Well, hopefully there's a wide enough swath of viewers for that, but does Coca-Cola wanna put their name on that product? Does Nike wanna put their name on that product? Does the NFL or the NBA or uh, Fox News or what? Do they want to sponsor that product with their commercialization of it? Because therein, it's becoming pretty hard to keep large scale commercial sponsors happy with the content. And for the most part, to be happy with the content, that means they have to be on the cutting edge of the progressive ideology agenda. And I don't think that's going to work with a, with a show like uh, The Chosen. And not only that, but the platform has to be comfortable in carrying it because the last thing they want is to have a product that becomes overtly controversial and have to dial back with apologies or retractions or things like that. So the second then you have these kind of three things overlaid, the viewers, the sponsors, and the platform being willing to carry it, you have to then almost by, by necessity dial back all of the offensive nature of, uh, of this thing because it is religious essentially, right? It is purveying religiosity uh, overtly. You're gonna have to dial that back enough to keep all three of those groups happy. And I say, you've already despoiled the product in so doing forth. And I'll keep this point brief here. I just don't know the theology of the producers. And even if I did, I don't have much guarantee that it would remain what it initially became or initially started off as. How many times have you, t you saw a TV show or a series where it started off good? And by the time you get to episode four or season four, the thing is just whack. It's just off the train tracks completely. And all of a sudden there's crazy characters and storylines being invented. You're like, this isn't what I started watching four seasons ago. Well, I just don't know the theology of the producers here. Are, are any of them ordained? Are any of them ministers? Do any of them have qualifications? Is there any education? Are any of the, how about this? Is there anybody that is producing this show that is actually subject to church discipline? In other words, if they go wild, uh, you have, you know, season seven, Disciples Gone Wild or something like that. Could anybody be disciplined ecclesiastically for a purveying false teaching? If not, then I'm going to have to say I'm pretty concerned about it. I just don't know who's producing this, and I'm not exactly sure why either. Fifth reason here, because of star defections. Now, let's call this the Amy Grant rule, okay? Um, so uh, American Christians love it when stars profess their faith. Um, American Christians love that. They gobble that up. They'll say, oh, didn't you hear this NFL player say something about Jesus? Or remember when Tim Tebow put uh, John 3.16 on his eye black? Well, Tebow is actually kind of the exception to the Amy Grant rule because he does very seriously appear to back up his convictions for the most part insofar as I know. But the Amy Grant rule goes something like this. You know, the moment you put the gospel in the mouth of a performer, you run the risk of that of said performer then turning their back on the Christian faith and being equally, if not <laughs> worse, of a counter witness that they were when they were faithful and famous. Okay, so Amy Grant's like literally doing that right now. She just did a, a gay wedding or something like that. Uh, same thing is true with almost any Christian celebrity. You have to be very careful that you don't entrust the Christian message to celebritism. I just have a very strong concern with that. You can call it the Jennifer Knapp rule or the Bono from YouTube rule, YouTube, the Bono from U2 rule. Um, either way, whenever you try to use celebrities as spokespersons for Christianity, the moment they turn away from a traditional or biblical view is the moment that you really run into trouble and you've essentially uh, you've you lost the plot. Okay, sixth, people are telling me that The Chosen is the greatest form of evangelism that we have contemporarily. I have to disagree with that. Now, I don't even know if The Chosen works in terms of evangelism. I'm sure there's certain persons out there that have said that the show has inspired or re-inspired their faith. I don't know if that bears itself out in real numbers or if there's actually going to be any long-term sustainable reaction to this particular television show. But I will tell you this, I have my doubts. I have my doubts um, because anytime evangelism becomes itself a product, I'm very skeptical that it's going to be able to sustain with real saving, staying power. Far more powerful is simple personal evangelism. 
if you want to evangelize and do the work of sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then I say to you this, go invite your neighbor to church. Uh, that works. Um, friends sharing the gospel with their friends over coffee, that seems to work. That seems to be a biblical thing to invite people to come to Jesus, to share uh, their own saving encounters with Jesus with other people. That's just person-to-person -person evangelism. Church planting absolutely works. If there's one thing that we know in terms of evangelism that actually works, it's the New Testament method of sharing the gospel by way of church planting. Uh, but television shows, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I have my doubts. And seventh then, uh, please don't fault me for this, but I simply hold and hold quite, quite sincerely to the ordinary means of grace. I think that if we really want to share the good news of the gospel with the world, then we should do it in those ways which the Bible commands us to share the gospel, namely through the faithful teaching and preaching of the word of God, through the administration of the sacraments, through the catechizing of our own children and our families, and certainly the evangelism of the nations. These are the ordinary means of grace that God has given us to convey the good news of the message of Christ to the world. Now, maybe I totally missed it, but uh, if I did, you can correct me in the comments. I'm sure you will. Thank you so much for checking into this channel. Hey, don't forget, my new book, Souls, How Jesus Saves Sinners, is available on Audible. You can listen to it on, uh, on Audible while you're running or walking or doing whatever you want to do. And uh, also, don't forget, you can now get this little short little podcast on Spotify or Google Podcast. Thanks for checking in. Do love you lots. And we'll talk to you later.